All France, it has often been said, is a garden. And if you love France, as I do, it can be a very beautiful garden. For myself, I found it healing and soothing to the spirit. I recovered from the shocks and bruises which I had received in my own country. But there comes a day when you are well again and strong, when this atmosphere ceases to be nourishing. You long to break out and test your powers. Then the French spirit seems inadequate. You long to make friends, to create enemies, to look beyond walls and cultivated patches of earth. You want to cease thinking in terms of life insurance, sick benefits, old age pensions, and so on. Welcome to Positive Readings. That was an excerpt from Henry Miller's The Colossus of Marushi. In that excerpt, Miller was talking about the importance that France was to him and how that helped him uh, get over the challenges that he experienced in America. Uh, that experience of rebuilding himself is captured in the two novels that he's known for uh, mostly, which is The Tropic of Capricorn and The Tropic of Cancer. Before I get into the Colossus of Marushi, I'd like to take a moment to talk about my own Parisian garden. I'm talking about Commutin. This is a novel that I wrote. It's my second novel. Uh, you can link to, to it in the description. Please check it out. That would be greatly appreciated. Miller's The Colossus of Marushi is described on the back here as one of the top five great travel books. It is a travel narrative, but like all of Miller's work, it's much more than that. It's a meditation on uh, a whole bunch of topics. The Colossus, from the title, is actually a poet, uh, a Greek poet named uh, Katsimbalis. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing these correctly. Uh, that poet, even though he has the title uh, or, or is referred to in the title of the book, does not seem to be that important to the story itself. It's, this is really Miller's story, like all of his books, and his experience, and the thoughts that he's having while he's in that moment, uh, those moments of experience. The, the book can be divided in three sections. Uh, it is divided in three sections. The first section mainly deals with his travels in Corfu uh, with uh, a writer friend of his uh, named Lawrence Durrell. Uh, the second longer section is uh, Miller um, with Katsimbalis and uh, some others traveling through Crete and then the final section when he's back in Athens uh, he has to leave and this is right right before the the start of uh, World War II or right before World War II get, is getting to uh, Greece so he has to kind of flee and go back to America. As with all of Miller's work there's this anti-modernity, uh, anti- kind of um, modern life, kind of criticism about race and about and uh, the way people are living. And he gets some respite from that in Greece and he mixes this in with his descriptions of uh, this, the countryside life. So that's what I'm going to look at right here. The landscape does not recede. It installs itself in the open spaces of the heart. It crowds in, accumulates, dispossesses. You are no longer riding through something. Call it nature, if you will, but participate in, in a rout, a rout of the forces of greed, malevolence, envy, selfishness, spite, intolerance, pride, arrogance, cunning, duplicity, and so on. So he's describing here as he's traveling through uh, this, this countryside and how this is um, kind of almost cleansing him of uh, all these, I don't know, bad things from, from the modern life, whether uh, that's malevolence, greed, envy, um, pride. Uh, he's, he's, he's being cleansed of these as he travels through. It is the morning of the first day of the great peace, the peace of the heart, which comes with surrender. I never knew the meaning of peace until I arrived in Epidaurus. Like everybody, I had used the word all my life without once realizing that I was using a counterfeit. He's talking about the word peace. 
Peace is not the opposite of war any more than death is the opposite of life. The poverty of language, which is to say the poverty of man's imagination or the poverty of his inner life, has created an ambivalence which is absolutely false. I am talking, of course, of the peace which passeth all understanding. There is no other kind. The peace which most of us know is merely a sensation of hostilities, a truce, an interrogum, a lull, a respite, which is negative. The peace of the heart is positive and invincible, demanding no conditions, requiring no protection. It just is. So this peace that Miller is having an epiphany to realize in is a surrender. This is similar to some of the ideas that he presents in his other works, this, this concept of uh, following your desire until you reach this point of surrender, and that's like this real peace um, that uh, you can get. It's this greater understanding, and this is, I believe, what he's, he's describing in this scene. A little further on, he continues this theme. In our world, the blind lead the blind, and the sick go to the sick to be cured. We are making constant progress, but it is a progress which leads to the operating table, to the poorhouse, to the insane asylum, to the trenches. We have no healers. We have only butchers whose knowledge of anatomy entitles them to a diploma, which in turn entitles them to carve out or amputate our illnesses so that we may carry on in crippled fashion until such time as we are fit for the slaughterhouse. We announce the discovery of this cure and that, but make no mention of the new diseases which we have created en route. So again, this is the anti-modernity, anti um, kind of everything being measured, this lifestyle that Miller sees as the modern lifestyle which he is rejected, uh, which he finds repulsive, and he's looking at, this would be what he called in um, Tropic of Capricorn, the death rhythm. So trying to find ways to avoid death leads us to this kind of uh, quantification of life. Everything's measured. Uh, we have all these new means to tackle symptoms, but we have no real cure because we haven't changed how we live. So this is very much um, in the veins of uh, Henry David Thoreau, uh, also Emerson, Whitman. Uh, these are all uh, predecessors for Miller's thinking and his style. That previous section was dealing with health. Uh, now we're going to be dealing with more like modern transportation. So on the way to Crete, uh, Miller actually flies. Uh, th this would, would have been definitely a luxury of, of the time. Uh, mostly he gets around on a boat uh, in this book and for that time period. Again, this is 1941 when this book was published. Uh, so this is what he says uh, about flying on the airplane. We were probably making 100 miles an hour, but since we passed nothing but clouds, I had the impression of not moving. In short, it was unrelievedly dull and pointless. I was sorry that I had not booked passage on the good ship Acropolis, which was to touch at Crete shortly. Man is made to walk the earth and sail the seas. The conquest of the air is reserved for a later stage in his evolution, when he will have sprouted real wings and assumed the form of the angel, which he is in essence. Mechanical devices have nothing to do with man's real nature. They are merely traps which death has baited for him. So mechanical devices are these traps that death has used to, uh, as bait to capture us, to bring us in. Uh, but he's imagining, too, that uh, at some future stage, uh, man will be ready to fly when we reach this greater, um, I guess, greater realization, greater evolution. Uh, this, maybe this is tongue-in-cheek here, but uh, perhaps not. Similarly, these technology changes the communities. And again, just a few pages later, this is on page 100, uh, he talks about this. 
The great fundamental lack, which is apparent everywhere in our civilized world, is the total absence of anything approaching a communal existence. We have become spiritual nomads. Whatever pertains to the soul is derelict, tossed about by the winds like flotsam and jetsam. The village of Hagia Triada, looked at from any point in time, stands out like a jewel of consistency, integrity, significance. When a miserable Greek village, such as the one I am speaking of, and the counterpart of which we have by the thousand in America, embellishes its meager, stultified life by the adoption of telephone, radio, automobile, tractor, etc., the meaning of the word communal becomes so fantastically distorted that one begins to wonder what is meant by the phrase human society. There is nothing human about these sporadic agglomerations of beings. They are beneath any known level of life which this globe has known. They are less in every way than the pygmies who are truly nomadic and who move in filthy freedom with delicious security. So again, Miller sees technology as destroying the community and he, as going back to these small villages, uh, he sees when they, when they lack that te technology as that being a um, more freedom, he called it filthy freedom when he's referring to the pygmies, but uh, this idea of, uh, you know, that's the way man should be living, but once they introduce the automobile, uh, the telephone, the radio, all these other um, forms that are supposed to connect us and do connect us, he sees that as destroying uh, communal existence. This book is also political. Um, later in the, in the book, uh, page 142, we have a reflection, uh, a memory of an experience in Paris that kind of shows the, uh, the brutal nature of humans, but also the, uh, the ways that humans deceive themselves. So in this scene, Miller's discussing uh, being at a cinema, and at the beginning, before the movie starts, uh, they're shown uh, scenes from a war, uh, specifically from uh, the Japanese uh, committing atrocities in China, and uh, he reflects on the reaction that the audience has. I think of that preliminary warning, which I saw always in French cinemas, and which was repeated, doubtless, in every language under the sun except the German, Italian, and Japanese, whenever a newsreel was shown of the bombing of a Chinese city. I remember it for the very special reason that at the first showing of the destruction of Shanghai, the streets littered with mutilated bodies, which were being hastily shoveled into carts like so much garbage. There arose in this French cinema such a pandemonium as I had never heard before. The French public was outraged, and yet pathetically, humanly enough, they were divided in their indignation. The rage of the just ones was overwhelmed by the rage of the virtuous ones. The latter, curiously enough, were outraged that such barbarous, inhuman scenes could be shown to such well-behaved, law-abiding, peace-loving people as they imagined themselves to be. They wanted to be protected from the anguish of enduring such a scene even at the comfortable distance of three or 4,000 miles. They had paid to see a drama of love in comfortable seats, and by some monstrous and wholly unaccountable faux pas, this nasty slice of reality had been shoved before their eyes and their peaceful, idle evening virtually ruined. Such was Europe before the present debacle. Such is America today, and such it will be tomorrow when the smoke has cleared away. And as long as human beings can sit and watch with hands folded while their fellow men are tortured and butchered, so long will civilization be a hollow mockery, a wordy phantom suspended like a mirage above a swelling sea of murdered carcasses. So the reaction in the cinema was really divided. Uh, one group of people were outraged by the, the murder, the atrocities that were going on in Shanghai, uh, but even more people were just outraged that they had to see it. They went there to enjoy themselves, to see uh, a performance, a drama, and, and this is what they were watching instead. And uh, they thought that was, as he called it, a faux pas, that slice of reality. It was too much. 
and the reflection that Miller has, and we should keep in mind this is on the eve of World War II and, and another kind of uh, barbarous act, a swell and sea of murdered carcasses, as he says, um, in, his, in the same thing, this idea that people are uh, rejecting this. They, they're pretending they're not seeing it, and, and that's why he says that uh, civilization is a hollow mockery, a wordy phantom. It's something that they talk about being civilized, but people actually aren't. They just don't want to see the atrocities. Another topic that Miller takes on, which is very much related to the other ones that we're looking at, is the concept of manhood. What does it mean to be a man? Uh, this is what he says about, uh, about that topic when he's reflecting on the Greek men that he's meeting on this trip. For the first time in my life, too, I had met men who were like men ought to be. That is to say, open, frank, natural, spontaneous, warm-hearted. These were the types of men I had expected to meet in my own land when I was growing up to manhood. I never found them. In France, I found another order of human beings, a type whom I admired and respected, but whom I never felt close to. In every possible way that I can think of, Greece presented itself to me as the very center of the universe, the ideal meeting place of man with man in the presence of God. It was the first voyage I had ever made which was wholly satisfactory, in which there was no slightest trace of disillusionment, in which I was offered more than I had expected to find. So Miller has this notion that men need to be open, frank, natural, spontaneous, warm-hearted. These aren't the kind of men he met in America. Uh, he meets a different type, of, different type of men in France, but it's still not the same. It's not the expectation. This kind of brings us back to the very first passage that I read. Uh, but here in Greece, he gets more than he expected. He gets this um, men the way they're supposed to be, as he says here. Uh, continuing on this same idea. To those who think that Greece today is of no importance, let me say that no greater error could be committed. Today, as of old Greece, is of the utmost importance to every man who is seeking to find himself. My experience is not unique, and perhaps I should add that no people in the world are as much in need of what Greece has to offer as the American people. Greece is not merely the antithesis of America. But more, the solution of the ills which plague us. Economically, it may seem unimportant, but spiritually, Greece is still the mother of nations, the fountainhead of wisdom and inspiration. So the irony here is that throughout this book, Miller is meeting a lot of Greeks who already went to America and came back, and they love it. They love the uh, the wealth, they love the, um, the opportunities that they had, the fast-paced life. Miller can't really understand those people. Uh, who he is celebrating are the, the Greeks who are living in these small villages, um, who are simple, uh, who are honest. And this is what he thinks that um, America needs. America needs this experience of going out to a place like that and seeing uh, real life and uh, real people. In that previous excerpt, Miller is almost offering advice for uh, the American reader. Get out, go, go see some other, uh, some other foreign lands, uh, see other ways that people live, and hopefully that will uh, cleanse you of some, uh, some pollution that you've gathered in this modern society. Uh, and then end in the book here, he, he talks about the fact of why people don't go on these types of journeys. People seem astounded and enthralled when I speak of the effect which this visit to Greece produced upon me. They say they envy me and that they wish they could one day go there themselves. Why don't they? Because nobody can enjoy the experience he desires until he is ready for it. People seldom mean what they say. Anyone who says he is burning to do something other than he is doing or to be somewhere else than he is is lying to himself. To desire is not merely to wish. To desire is to become that which one essentially is. Some men reading this will inevitably realize that there is nothing to do but act out their desires. So again, this brings us back to this, 
this concept that he has about following your desire, which is on full display in uh, the Tropic books. And, and um, after this, um, his uh, Rosie Crucifixion trilogy. But uh, so this, this thing that, this idea that people desire something, but they don't actually act on it. And he's saying they're actually lying to themselves and that they need to come to this realization that they need to just follow their desire that they want to do. That would be the life rhythm uh, and not uh, do the practical thing. So this would seem to be subversive advice, but this is what you're going to get in a Miller book. It's so a last word on the Colossus of Marushi. Uh, this book is, as a, as a travel book and just kind of reflections, it's a very quick read. The style is deceptively simple. Uh, the vocabulary is quite interesting. I got a whole list of new words that um, uh, he uses. Uh, that I hadn't come across in other, other works, uh, like a Shakespearean writer in some, in, in some ways. Thank you for watching.